Now let's look at Elijah and in his message and see how it is related to the end of days. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah approaches King Ahab, the king of Israel at the time, and he communicates to him, being a prophet, that he has departed from Torah. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 and verses 17 and 18, it is written, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself unto Ahab. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Are you he that troubles Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house. You've troubled Israel. How or why? In that you've forsaken the commandments or the Torah of the Lord. So Elijah points out to Ahab that in forsaking the commandments that he is worshiping Baal. 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 17 and 18 Ahab once again asks Elijah, Are you he that troubles Israel? Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel, but it's you and your father's house, and you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed Balaam. Now, let's understand what the nation of Israel was doing. Because in growing up in traditional Christianity and reading the scriptures... I wrote in my mind that the nation of Israel were not at all worshiping and acknowledging the God of Israel, but they were doing something completely separate, a completely separate religion, and the God of Israel wasn't even in their thoughts and their prayers and in their mindset. But I'm going to show you that that was not the case. I'm going to show you that what the nation of Israel was doing, they were believing in and following and seeking to practice the ways of the God of Israel, but they had brought in mixed worship or Baal worship in doing so. And that's what Elijah came to proclaim is to show, no, you've brought in this mixed worship and you're not doing it the way the God of Israel instructed you to do. Let's see this from 2 Kings in chapter 17. The setting here is that the Assyrians had come and they had taken captive the northern kingdom. And they had taken the priests of, and, and the spiritual leaders of the northern kingdom to Assyria, but things weren't going well in the land. And so it was asked, why aren't things going well? And it was said it's because... Uh, uh, the land is reacting this way because the teaching and the instruction of the God of Israel is no longer happening in the land. That's the background of 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 27 and 28, as it is written. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from there, and let them go and dwell, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Now, is fearing the Lord a good thing? Yes, because in the book of Proverbs it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 32, it says... So they feared the Lord. And then the next verse, verse 33 says, they feared the Lord. I'd like to reiterate to you that that's good. That's positive. But let's look at the context of how they feared the Lord. 2 Kings 17, verse 32. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and they sacrificed at the high places. Next verse, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. 
They feared the Lord and so served their own gods. What type of gods are they following? After the manner of the nations whom they carried away from there. They're fearing the Lord, but they're following after the culture and the ways of the people around them. Now in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 34, after stating in the two previous verses that they feared the Lord, this verse says, unto this day they do after the former manners, they fear not the Lord. Did you catch that? In 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 32 and 33, it says about the people that they feared the Lord. And then verse 34 says, they feared not the Lord. So did they fear the Lord or did they not fear the Lord? The answer is yes. They did fear the Lord in their hearts. But they didn't fear the Lord according to how he said, you're to worship me. So it says they fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the Torah. Now let's give this a modern application. Are there those who go to Sunday church that love the Lord, that, that want to follow Him, that want to be pleasing in His sight? Yes, there are. There's a great many who are in Sunday church that love the Lord, that want to serve Him, that want to do His will. Are they seeking to do it according to the Torah given at Mount Sinai? No. So how does the Bible view that? The Bible would say they fear the Lord but they're doing it after their own way. And they're not fearing the Lord according to the commandments he gave at Mount Sinai. The Lord here is who? Jesus, the Messiah. So let's look at the pattern. 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 32 and 33, it says they feared the Lord and served their own gods. Then verse 34 says they didn't fear the Lord by following his commandments. And then the chapter ends in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 41, by saying these words, So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images. That is the problem that Elijah comes to confront. He comes and says, Look, you are not worshiping the God of Israel the way he instructed you to do. Now, you know your Bible well enough to know that when the prophets came to the nation of Israel, they weren't well received. Do you know why? It's because they were viewed as being elitist. They're the spiritually righteous ones. You know, who are you to say that I'm not following after the God of Israel? I love the God of Israel. I go to church every Sunday. Um, I'm seeking to do what's right. You know, I, I pray. I read my Bible. Who are you to come to tell me that I'm not doing it the way that God wants me to do? That's the reason why the prophet message. And the message of Elijah is challenged to be received. But this is the issue that Elijah and his message and his ministry confronts in the end of days. His message, Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, remember the Torah of Moses. Let's look then how Israel worshipped the God of Israel. It was through what the Bible calls mixed worship. They feared the God of Israel and served their own gods, which in essence is the mixed worship. Doing things that the God of Israel said, but mixing it with the customs and the ways and the practices of the people around them. And they did not fear Yahweh by following his Torah. Now let's look what are some of the characteristics of Baal worship? Because the nation of Israel was involved in Baal worship. Baal worship comes about when you don't follow Torah. And in not doing so, the Bible says that you're following idolatry. 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. They rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers... They left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images and served Baal. You see what they did? They left his commandments, his Torah, and they served Baal. 
Baal worship was done in the temple of the God of Israel. 2 Kings chapter 22, in verses 3 and 4, it is written, It came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, he's a king of Judah, that the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Was there was was it that just Baal worship and Baal worship alone that was done in the temple? You th you believe there was no prayer done under the God of Israel, and there was nothing done in the temple um, that was in part what he had commanded to do? You know that there were things done in that temple that the God of Israel commanded to be done. But they had brought in other things that were associated with Baal. That was the problem. And this Baal worship involved setting up of sacred trees in the temple of the God of Israel. 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove. The word grove is the Strong's number 842. It's the Hebrew word Asherah. And an Asherah was something that was a part of the Canaanite worship system. And it was a sacred tree that was set up near an altar. Baal worship also involved worshiping Ashtardi or Ishtar, which has been anglicized into Easter. Judges chapter 2 verses 11 and 13. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and they served Baalim. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth is the Strong's number 6252, which is the Hebrew word Ashtoreth. And this was a Canaanite goddess that was related to sex and fertility. Now in going to traditional Christian church, when it was Christmas season, you know where I saw in the, the, the church that I grew up in, where they put the Christmas tree at? Right by the altar. And that's exactly what the children of Israel did. They set up the Asherah or the grove in the temple of the Lord. And this custom that the children of Israel did in serving Baal and Ashtoreth, the goddess of sex and fertility, that custom has been incorporated in various cultures and it's from these customs where... We have the Easter bunny, the Easter egg, and the fertility that is associated with the celebration of the spring of the year. Now, Baal worship also involved sun worship. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 3 and verse 5. It came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that he put down the idolatrous priests, them also that burned incense unto Baal to the sun, and to all the host of heaven. I have here for you in this slide a artist's rendition of Jesus. And I want you to notice above his head there's a little halo. And if you've been to church throughout the last 20, 30 years or in your life, you probably would have seen pictures in your church on the church wall where there's this halo over there. That halo is associated with sun worship. As a matter of fact, I have on the top picture a picture of the Vatican in Rome. And if you study the layout of the Vatican, it is laid out according to symbols of sun worship. And in the middle of the Vatican, there's an obelisk. And that obelisk in ancient Egypt was associated with sun worship. So we have incorporated into the faith today those that believe Jesus is the Messiah. And by the way, he is the Messiah. That is correct. That is biblical. We brought in the customs of the nations and incorporated it and mixed it with true faith and Jesus as the Messiah. And this is what Elijah comes in the end of days and points out. 
Baal worship involves sacrifices and burnt offerings. 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 20 through 22, verse 24 and verse 28, it is written. And Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal, and they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. See, Jehu set up a test for those who were Baal worshipers. And when all those assembled who were the Baal worshipers, um, then he destroyed the Baal worshipers. So let's look at these scriptures that spoke of Baal worship and how it was done in the nation of Israel. Baal worship was done in the temple of the God of Israel. They were also worshiping him, that is the God of Israel, in the temple. So this was mixed worship unto him in his temple. Baal worship involved setting up sacred trees or Asherah trees near an altar. It involved the worship of Ashtardi or Ishtar or it's been anglicized as Easter, which is the fertility cult. It involved the offering of sacrifices and burnt offerings. It involved sun worship. Jeroboam set up a mixed worship system. Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom. And in 1 Kings we're told that the worship system that he sent up was likened unto the building of the golden calf which the children of Israel did in the wilderness after they received the Ten Commandments. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28 and verse 29, it is written, Whereupon the king took counsel, and he made two calves of gold and said, It's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. This is making a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, where in the Torah it says three times a year all the males are to go to Jerusalem, where Jeroboam didn't want the men of Israel to go to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was under the jurisdiction of Rehoboam, king of Judah. And he didn't want the allegiance to turn to Rehoboam and not to him. So he says, no, we can't have the people go to Jerusalem. We will do what is done in Jerusalem, but we will do it, as it says in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 29, we will do it in two other places, Bethel and also in Dan. Then in doing so, Jeroboam, he celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the Torah says it is the seventh month and the 15th day of the month. He kept the Feast of Tabernacles, but he said, we're going to do it in the eighth month in the 15th day of the month. A substitute place, a substitute time, or substitute holidays. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 32, Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day, like unto the feast that is in Judah, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the seventh month in the 15th day of the month, as is mentioned in Leviticus in chapter 23. Baal worship is a golden calf or mixed worship system. 2 Kings 17, verse 16. They left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images unto two calves. Made them molten images unto two calves. What were they doing? They set up a worship system in Bethel and Dan, which the Bible was calling serving Baal. Let's see how the children of Israel, in coming out of Egypt receiving the Torah by Jesus at Mount Sinai. Let's look at more closely Exodus in chapter 32, the building of the golden calf. And let's see when the children of Israel built the golden calf, they were proclaiming worship under the God of Israel. Once again, in my mind, as I was watching movies like the Ten Commandments and uh, went to church, I had it in my mind that when they built the golden calf, they weren't worshiping the golden, they weren't worshiping the God of Israel at all. I thought that they were worshiping one of the gods of Egypt. 
Well, what they did is they made an idol of the God of Israel in their mind and they worshipped him according to the image that they had of him in their mind. Let's see this. Exodus chapter 32, verses 4 through 6. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation regarding the building of the golden calf. And this is what he says to the people regarding the golden calf. Tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. They built the calf and said, we're having a feast to Yahweh, the one that brought us out of Egypt. And so it says in verse 6, they rose up early on the morrow and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. I'd like to submit to you that having a festival and having burnt offerings and peace offerings is how the God of Israel said in the Torah that he was to be worshipped. They're doing it the way he said be worshipped, but they said the God of Israel is that calf. They made an image of the God of Israel in their mind and worshipped, and they feared him according to the imagination in their heart. And I'd like to submit to you that that is the case in Christianity today. We've made an image of how the God of Israel is to be worshipped and we do it according to that image and not according to how is specified in the Torah and that is why Elijah comes in the end of days and points out and makes the distinction and says, um, choose what you're going to do. Quit following this mixed worship. And if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the lawgiver, then worship him according to how he said he wanted to be worshipped in the Torah. Because this is a part of preparing for his second coming. Messiah isn't coming for a bride that's involved in mixed worship. He's coming for a bride that worships him in spirit and in truth. What happened then when the children of Israel built this golden calf? They made a festival unto it, which was mixed worship of the God of Israel. They offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and... There was substitute biblical holidays. Now let's look at Baal worship, which the Bible also calls the golden calf system of worship, which is mixed worship under the God of Israel and see how it's incorporated into our belief as Jesus is the Messiah today. On one hand, we proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah and he died on the cross and he shed his blood to save sinners. That is absolutely, totally true. That is a valid and accurate message. But we mix faith in him by saying we need to celebrate Christmas and Easter, which is not how the Torah says that the God of Israel is to be worshipped. This is mixed worship. This is a golden calf type of worship. So Elijah comes and says, you're involved in mixed worship. Choose now whether you're going to be involved in this mixed worship or worship the God of Israel according to his Torah. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long will you be between two opinions? If the Lord be Lord, follow him. What does it mean, follow him? It means follow Torah. But if Baal, then follow him. Or the mixed worship system. Therefore, Elijah comes in the end of days and says, In order to prepare for the coming of the Messiah... You need to choose between Sabbath, given in the Torah, or Sunday, which is mixed worship, which ultimately, if you study, came from Constantine and Roman Catholicism. We need to choose whether we're going to be keeping the biblical feasts, which includes Passover, or Easter, which came from Constantine, from Roman Catholicism. Now let's look at reasons why mixed worship is accepted and why the Elijah message is rejected. I have three reasons which I'm going to be covering with you. The first reason is religious tradition and customs that are, how, that are handed down to succeeding generations. Those customs and traditions are so strong 
that the people want to hold on to the customs and the tradition. Second reason, not fully understanding who Jesus is. The third reason is the spirit of Jezebel, which is also the spirit of rebellion. Let's look at reason number one, because of religious tradition and custom that has been handed down from generation to generation. And there has been Sunday worship since the time of Constantine, 1700 years. We have Christmas and Easter that got incorporated following these times. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 41. Once again, it says, These nations feared the Lord and served their graven images. Look, both their children and their children's children as their fathers. They're doing it as their fathers. Both their children and their children's children. They're fearing the Lord and serving their graven images. Or more accurately, they're worshiping the God of Israel and the image that they have in their mind from the custom and tradition. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 verse 9, But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What, are, what is Christianity teaching for doctrine? Sunday. What are they teaching for doctrine? Christmas. What are they teaching for doctrine? Easter. So making the word of God, that is the Torah, of none effect. We don't need to follow Torah through the tradition that has brought, been brought down. In the Wikipedia Encyclopedia, it quotes from the Catholic Virginian, October the 3rd, 1947, where the Catholic Church states explicitly that it was them who changed the Sabbath to Sunday. Other Roman Catholic sources can be cited to show that according to the Catholic Church, there is no scriptural basis for neglecting Saturday observance. From the Catholic Virginian, October the 3rd, 1947. Nowhere in the Bible do we find that Jesus or the apostles ordered that the Sabbath be changed from Saturday to Sunday. We have the commandment of God given to Moses to keep holy the Sabbath day, that is the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Today, most Christians keep Sunday because it has been revealed to us by the Roman Catholic Church outside of the Bible. And what is a term that's given to the non-Catholic Christian world? Protestants. And what does that word mean? Protesters. Protesters of the Catholic Church. Well, there's been protest of the Catholic Church, but not everything of the Catholic Church has been protested. Protestants don't protest Sunday. Protestants don't protest Christmas and Easter. They protest whether you follow the Pope or not. But see, they got their own Pope. It's called the pastor who says we don't follow the Torah. And if he says we don't follow the Torah, then we listen to him. If he says, well, the Bible says we uh, are to keep Sunday, we listen to him. If he says, well, it's okay, it's just whatever's in your heart about Christmas and Easter, we follow him. Next, from the Wikipedia Encyclopedia, in speaking about the First Council of Nicaea in 325, we are told it was at this Council of Nicaea where... It was sanctioned that Easter be celebrated rather than Passover. The first council of Nicaea held in Nicaea in Bithynia, which is present-day Turkey, convoked by the Roman Emperor Constantine I in 325, was the first ecumenical conference of bishops of the Christian church and most significantly resulted in the first uniform Christian doctrine called the Nicene Creed. The council decided in favor of celebrating the resurrection on the first Sunday after the first full moon following the vernal equinox, independently of the Bible's Hebrew calendar, and authorized the Bishop of Alexandria to announce annually the exact date to his fellow bishops when Easter would be celebrated. Once again, from the Wikipedia Encyclopedia, Quoting from the Anti-Nicene or before the Nicene Church Fathers, we are told that Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, that he kept Passover and Sabbath. 
as it is written. Polycarp, a disciple of John, adhered to a Nisan 14, which is biblical Passover observance. Irenaeus, who observed the first Sunday rule, notes of Polycarp, one of the bishops of Asia Minor, for Anicetus could not persuade Polycarp to forego the observance of his Nisan 14 or Passover practice, insomuch as these things had always been observed by John, the disciple of the Lord, and by the other apostles with whom he had been and had conversations with. Irenaeus notes that this was not only Polycarp's practice, but this but that this was the practice of John the disciple and the other apostles that Polycarp knew. What are we being told? That John and the apostles and the disciple of John, Polycarp, they kept Passover. It was the first council of Nicaea that it was declared that Christians don't follow Passover anymore, that they follow Easter and that this tradition has been brought down for 1,700 years as the way to express faith in Jesus as the Messiah. However, John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 and verse 6, regarding expressing faith in Jesus as the Messiah, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What commandments? The Torah. He that says, I know him. He that says, I know Jesus and doesn't keep his commandments, doesn't follow Torah, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He that says he abides in him, he that says he's a believer and a follower of Jesus, ought himself to walk even as he or Jesus walked. So how did Jesus walk or live his life? Because he that abides in him ought to walk as he walked. Well, Jesus kept Sabbath. Jesus kept Passover. Let's look at the source of December 25th, which is celebrated as Jesus' birthday. From the Wikipedia Encyclopedia, it is explained to us that December 25th, historically, was the birthday of the sun god. Christmas is an annual holiday that marks the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. The word Christmas is a contraction meaning Christ's Mass. The Romans held a festival on December 25th called Dies Natalis Solus Invicti, meaning the birthday of the unconquered sun. The use of the title Sol Invictus allowed several solar deities or gods to be worshipped collectively, including Elah Gabal, a Syrian sun god, Sol, the god of Emperor Aurelian, and Mithras, and Mithras. So these practices of the religion of the Roman Empire, of which the main religion was sun worship, got incorporated into Christianity at the expense of the Torah. There is a prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 19, about the end of days, which says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction... What period of time is the day of affliction? It's the tribulation. So in the end of days, in tribulation times, it says, The Gentiles will come unto you from the end of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. So what are some of the lies that Christianity has inherited from our fathers? Going back to Constantine, Sunday worship, Christmas, and Easter. Easter. The second reason why the Elijah message is rejected, the first being religious tradition, the second is not knowing who Jesus is. We're told in James chapter 4 verse 12 that there is one lawgiver who is able to save. Who is that one lawgiver who's able to save? It's Jesus. So the reason why we accept the words well, we're not to follow the law is because we don't know that Jesus is the lawgiver. Do you know what I would like to believe why the majority of Christianity expresses their faith the way they do? Religious tradition 
and not knowing who Jesus is. And it's being done out of ignorance. That's what I would like to believe, and that's what I predominantly believe. It is done out of ignorance. If it is being done out of ignorance, which once again I believe for the most part is the case with the majority of people, then when the truth is presented to them, then the people of the God of Israel should love the truth enough to want to follow the truth. And I see great many who when they hear the truth, they receive the truth, and they want to walk in the truth. And the God of Israel winked at our ignorance. But it says in the book of Acts, there's coming a time when he won't wink at our ignorance anymore. And that time has arrived with the message in the ministry of Elijah in the end of days. For those who hear the truth, but their hearts resist the truth, then that follows under the classification of the spirit of Jezebel or rebellion. And not knowing who Jesus is, most Christians don't associate Jesus with giving the law at Mount Sinai. Most Christians don't associate Jesus with the one creating the heavens and the earth. Often we go to Genesis and say, when God created the heavens and the earth, in our minds when we say God, we mean God the Father. Well, God the Father willed it, but Jesus spoke it. But he's, he's one with his Father, and he does what his Father wills him to do. Jesus created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breadth of his mouth. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, we're told explicitly that Jesus is the one that created the heavens and the earth. He's the image of the invisible God, that is God the Father, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, that is Jesus, were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. If you realize that we're told explicitly in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, that Jesus created the heavens and the earth, we are then told in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13 and 17, that you are to keep the Sabbath, that is the seventh day Sabbath of creation, because of the one, or to honor the one who created the heavens and the earth. Speak Thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. It is a sign, that is, the Sabbath is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. John told us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, he who abides in him ought to walk as he walked. How did Jesus walk or live his life? He kept the Sabbath. Luke chapter 4, verse 14, and Jesus, continuing in verse 15, taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. Verse, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, which means he did it on a regular basis. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Luke chapter 4, verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath days. Next, we need to understand that the biblical festivals are festivals of Yahweh. And in recognizing this, we need to understand who is Yahweh that these festivals are unto. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the feasts of Yahweh, does it say the feasts of the Jews, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. The festivals are the feasts of Yahweh. But who is Yahweh? Yeshua, or Jesus, is Yahweh. 
Traditionally, most often, when we read the word Yahweh or Lord in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, we read in our minds that this is referring to God the Father. However, the festivals in Leviticus 23 are fulfilled by Jesus the Messiah and not by the Father. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, we're told that Jesus is Lord or Yahweh. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord or Jesus is Yahweh. No one can say that he's Yahweh. No one can say that he is God but by the Holy Spirit. We can see in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, that Jesus is Yahweh, as it is written. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, confess that he is Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore... These are festivals of Yahweh, and who is Yahweh? Jesus is Yahweh. These are his feasts, which he proclaimed his people that believe on him to celebrate. Jesus not only kept the biblical Sabbath, but he also kept Passover. Up even to the moment that he died on the cross. Because we're told in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, and when his hour was come, that is to die on the cross, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and he said, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What is reason number one why the Elijah message isn't received? Religious tradition. Reason number two? not knowing who Jesus is. And both of those reasons can be reasons of ignorance. But the third one is not. The third one is the spirit of Jezebel or the spirit of rebellion. And the spirit of Jezebel opposes the Elijah message. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, it says, In Ahab, verse 31, took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal is the Strong's number 856, and it means in Hebrew, with Baal. So Jezebel is the daughter of with Baal. Jezebel is with Baal. Jezebel is with mixed worship. So... When the Elijah message is heard by one that has the spirit of Jezebel, they will reject the message. And they will try to say, don't listen to that message, because what did Jezebel do? 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. Who did Jezebel have a confrontation with? Elijah. What was Elijah's message? Don't follow after mixed worship. Follow after Torah. What does Jezebel do? Cuts off, cuts off Elijah or cuts off his message because she is with Baal. So the spirit of Jezebel says, don't follow Torah. The spirit of Jezebel says, no, we're not under the law. Don't follow the law. Don't listen to those that, pro that proclaim we should. Now, Jesus, once again, we need to be reminded that he is the Holy One of Israel. We looked at these scriptures earlier. Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 16, verse 10 is quoted in Acts chapter 2, verse 27. Regarding, verse 32, the resurrection of Jesus, as it is written, Because you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, 
whereof we are all witnesses. Realizing that Jesus is referred to as the Holy One or the Holy One of Israel, we were now going to look at Isaiah in chapter 30. And in verse 12, it's the Holy One of Israel who is speaking. That is Jesus the Messiah. And in verse 8, the Holy One of Israel tells Isaiah to write something in a book that the King James says is for the time to come. But we're going to look at that in the Hebrew and we're going to understand that in the Hebrew it says that it will be for the final generation. So this is something that Jesus has to say for the final generation or the generation that's alive who will see his second coming. The generation that will hear the Elijah message. In Isaiah chapter 30 verse 8 it is written, Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come is what the King James says. The word time is the Strong's number 3117. It's the Hebrew word yom which means day or a period of time. The word to come is the Strong's number 314. It's the Hebrew word akaron, which means later or latter or last of time. Therefore, in the Hebrew, this could be rendered, write it in a book that it will be for the last days, the end of days, or the final generation. What is it that Jesus has to say to the generation that will see his coming? Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 and 10, it is written, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the Torah of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. What's the right thing that a prophet prophesies of? You need to follow Torah, and this is where you're not following Torah. Don't have a prophet come to proclaim those things, prophesy unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Tell us that we're going to be rich and we don't need to follow Torah. Tell us that we're going to escape judgment and we're going to be raptured away in the pre-tribulation rapture. Tell us that we don't have to follow the law. The Elijah message prepares for the end of the exile of the 12 tribes. I mentioned at the beginning of this teaching that the God of Israel laid out history according to his relationship with his people. And his people broke the covenant at Mount Sinai that Jesus made with the nation of Israel. Therefore, he exiled them out into the nations of the world. While they'll be in exile in the nations of the world and being punished for breaking his commandments, Jesus allows Gentile nations to rule over the world and rule over his people. We see that capsulized in the book of Daniel, why Daniel's vision of the head of gold, Babylon, going down to the ten toes. The ten toes represents the reigning beast system of the end of days. The Gentile nations of the world are only given the duration of time of the nations of Israel's judgment to rule and reign in the earth. When the judgment of his people, when that time frame is over, the nations of the world will be judged and will fall he will gather his people from exile and set up a kingdom and rule and reign with them. That transition time is what we call the tribulation. Elijah's message is a message of preparing for the coming of the Messiah by showing the people where they need to be doing what Messiah wants, which is to follow Torah, to do away with mixed worship. And that prepares you for Messiah's coming and the ingathering of the exiles, the end of the exile of the house of Jacob, which is for the people in the family of Jesus the Messiah. 
he redeems his family. Therefore, when we're talking about gathering the exiles, we're talking about gathering those who are part of the family of Jesus the Messiah. Remember, Jesus has a literal house of Jacob and a redeemed house of Jacob. And the prayer that Jesus said to pray was, pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven represents the spiritual world. Earth represents the physical world. So therefore there's a time coming when the physical world and the spiritual world will be in unison with each other. We have a physical, literal house of Jacob. We have a redeemed house of Jacob. And in the redemption, uh, in the end of the exile of the 12 tribes, the physical and the literal become one and the same thing. Therefore, remember, the new covenant was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and all those who are part of that new covenant are grafted in. So when we're talking about gathering the exiles of Israel, we're talking about believers in Jesus as the Messiah being gathered and ending their exile because the Bible tells us the home of the people of the God of Israel is the land of Israel because that is the land that was promised Abraham by Jesus the Messiah. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 and verse 29. Now let's see how in 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 30 and 31 that the Elijah message prepares for the end of the exile of the twelve tribes. Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And the King James says, He repaired the altar of the Lord. The altar of the Lord is going to personify or represent the return to Torah. And it says he repaired the altar. The word for repair is the Strong's number 7495. It's the Hebrew word Rapha, which means to heal. You heard Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. What it literally says is he healed the altar. Now how can you heal an altar? It is speaking of a return to Torah or a restoration of Torah. So we have the restoration of Torah, which is associated with the gathering of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because as soon as he repaired the altar, healed the altar, it says Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. In the book, The Messiah Text by Raphael Patai on page 144, he explains from looking at the Hebrew text and the rabbi's understanding that Elijah will come and announce to the house of Jacob that the exile is over. Everywhere in the Bible, the name of Jacob is spelled without the letter Vav, except for five places. And everywhere, the name of Elijah is spelled with the Hebrew letter Vav, except for five places. Why? To teach you that Elijah will come and redeem the seed of Jacob. And to announce the redemption of the world to his children. The Elijah message that is also found in Isaiah chapter 40 is comfort my people. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. Verse 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness... Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Behold, the Lord will come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work. What's the work of the Messiah? To gather the exiles of Israel is before him. He, that is the Messiah, will feed his flock, that is the redeemed nation of Israel, like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. The message of Elijah, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. But what is the comfort of his people? It's the end of the exile. How is that the comfort of his people? Because the end of the exile means the Gentile nations are no longer ruling over the world and over the people of the God of Israel. It means Messiah has come, redeemed his people, and set up his kingdom. That's our comfort. 
Jeremiah 31, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, all ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel. Who scattered Israel? Jesus the Messiah. Why? Because they broke his commandments that he gave at Mount Sinai. Will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Jeremiah 31, verse 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning, that is exile, into joy, that is the end of the exile, and I will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your end, says the Lord, that your children will come again to their own border. Now, let's look how John the Baptist, or Yochanan the Immerser, how he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and how the things that were associated with his ministry thematically fit with the Elijah message or the Elijah ministry. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was a priest of the course of Abia. Luke chapter 1 verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. With this piece of information that he was of the course of Avia, we know what time of the year that he was serving in the temple. The Avia course was the eighth course of priests, as we can understand going back to 1 Chronicles chapter 24. Verse 1, verse 5, and verse 10 it is written. Now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. Thus were they divided by Lot. The eighth lot, or the eighth course, was Abia. In the first century, at the time of Jesus, Israel was divided into 24 districts. From the Talmud to Anit 26a, we are told the following information. This is the details concerning the Mahamadot. The earlier prophets instituted 24 Mishmarot, or districts, and each Mishmar, or district, was represented at the temple in Jerusalem by its own Ma'amad, or individual priests, Levites, and Israelites. The priests from each of the 24 districts served one week in the temple twice a year. The priests were divided into 24 divisions, with each division serving in the temple for one full week, Every half year. The division was subdivided into six families or groups, and each group was in service on one day of the week. Priests from each of the 24 districts of Israel served during the biblical feasts. Therefore, because we have two biblical feasts by the time we get to the eighth course, the course of Avia served in the tenth week of the year. At the temple, Zecharias was burning incense at the altar of the temple. Luke chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 11. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense, which means prayers, when he went into the temple of the Lord. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And what is being prayed at the altar? There is a set prayers known as the Amida, or the standing prayers, or the 18 benedictions. The Amida are 18 benedictions which are prayed three times a day by traditional Jews. Two of these 18 prayers are for the end of the exile of the house of Jacob and the coming of King Messiah. The coming of King Messiah is associated with the coming of Elijah who precedes King Messiah. From the Messiah text by Raphael Patai, on page 181, he explains that Orthodox Jews pray three times a day 
for the end of the exile of the house of Jacob and the coming of King Messiah. One of the great themes of the messianic cycle is one that since the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Romans in the year 70, Jews have prayed three times a day for the ingathering of the exiles, which for, which for them is synonymous with redemption or the end of the exile. Associated with this is the ten lost tribes who will be ingathered by the Messiah in the end of days. Continuing on, on page 321 of the Messiah text, the requests for redemption, the coming of Messiah addressed to God are part of the Amidah prayer, popularly known as the 18 benedictions, which is the most important Jewish prayer recited three times a day. We are now going to look at the 10th prayer, which is a prayer for the ingathering of the exiles. It goes like this. Blow the great shofar for our freedom and lift up a banner to gather our exiles and gather us from the four corners of the earth. Blessed are you, Lord, who gathers the banished of your people, Israel. In the book From Exile to Redemption, volume 1 by page, on page 156 by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, he explains that it's Jewish understanding that Elijah will proceed the coming of the Messiah. That is why in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 10, the disciples asked Jesus, why do the scribes or the rabbis teach that Elijah must first come or proceed the coming of King Messiah? Matthew chapter 17 verses 11 through 13, Jesus answered and said, Elijah truly shall, that is future, he will come and do what? Restore all things. What is he restoring? Faith in the God of Israel or Yeshua the Messiah by following Torah and keeping his commandments. But since we had a first coming of the Messiah, he explains, Elijah is come already, or the spirit of Elijah. But they knew him not. You see, likewise in the end of days, the majority of the body of Messiah will not know that Elijah is in their midst. But they've done unto him whatsoever they listed. They didn't want to hear his message. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them of John the Baptist. In Luke chapter 1 verse 13 and verse 17, it explains to us that John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He wasn't Elijah reincarnated. He came in this spirit and in his power and in his authority. Luke chapter 1 verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zecharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife shall bear you a son and shall call his name John. He will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. In Malachi chapter 4 verses 4 and 5, we're told what... The message is of Elijah, and it is, in verse 4, remember the Torah of Moses. Verse 5 of Malachi 4, behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. In keeping a traditional Passover celebration, there are four cups for a Passover celebration. Spiritually, the four cups of Passover teach us about our personal salvation in Messiah. The four cups represent the following. The cup of sanctification, the cup of affliction and deliverance, the cup of redemption, and the cup of his coming kingdom. In the book, From Exile to Redemption, Volume 1 on page 99, by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, he explains that it is a custom that at Passover that there is a cup that is set aside for Elijah. And the purpose of this cup is the Jewish people's belief that Elijah will precede the coming of the Messiah. 
This cup, known as the cup of Elijah, is not drunk like the four cups that are associated with Passover, but the cup of Elijah is poured out. The cup of Elijah reminds us that before Messiah will return, that Elijah will precede his coming. In step 14 of a traditional Passover Seder known as Hallel, where you drink the fourth cup, that is when a cup is poured for Elijah. Traditionally, at this time, the children go to the door to look for the coming of Elijah. Psalm 115 to 118 are recited. Then the great Hallel, or Psalm 136, is recited. Then you drink the fourth of the four cups of Passover. The fourth cup is known as the cup of his kingdom or the cup of his coming. And there is a song that is sung traditionally known as Haggadah. In Luke chapter 1, we're told of the details of the birth of John the Baptist or Yochanan the Immerser. It came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed his own house. That is Zacharias. That is after offering these prayers at the temple. He returned to his house. Verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and she hid herself for five months. Verse 57, 62 and 63 of Luke chapter 1, it is written, Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. And they made signs to his father how he would have be called or named. And he asked for a writing table and he wrote saying, His name is John. From these details that's given in Luke chapter 1, we can understand when John was born. He was born during Passover season. Allowing for the laws of separation mentioned in Leviticus chapter 15 verse 19 and verses 24 and 25 after Zacharias went back to his house as we're told in Luke chapter 1 verse 23. Then going forward nine months from the tenth week of the year plus two weeks plus nine months puts the birth of John around Passover season which would be the 14th day of the first month. The ministry message of John was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, Messiah is ready to set up his kingdom if you will repent. What does it mean to repent? Well, we are to repent from sin. But if we're going to repent from sin, we've got to know what sin is. Who is to repent? Well, the people of the God of Israel, the house of Jacob, as well as the whole world. Isaiah 58 verse 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your, your ruin. We have an explicit definition of sin in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 in the New Testament. Whosoever commits sin transgresses the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the Torah. So the message of Elijah is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're to repent of sin. If sin is transgressing the Torah, we have to repent of what sin is. We have to repent from transgressing the Torah, which means if we truly repent, we will follow the Torah. Continuing on in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3 regarding John's message his message is a quote of Isaiah or a reference to Isaiah in chapter 40 for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord repent that means follow Torah and to prepare the way or to follow after the way of the Lord by making his paths straight. What is the way of the Lord? It's following Torah. Psalm 25 verse 8. 
Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners, teach sinners in the way. Psalm 119 verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of the Lord. The way who walk in the Torah of the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 9 and verse 10. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, quoting from Isaiah in chapter 40, not only are we to prepare the way of the Lord, but make his paths straight. What is the path of the God of Israel? It's following Torah. Psalm 119, verse 35. Make me to go in the path of your commandments, for therein do I delight. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light. The ministry message of John is not only to repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. John preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of the God of Israel is... His Torah being written upon our heart. Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 6 by his disciples, teach us how to pray. And his answer is in Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. After this manner pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. What happens when his kingdom comes? Your will will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. You see, when Jesus comes and sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and he rules and reigns from Jerusalem, he will be teaching Torah to all nations and the will of the God of Israel will be done in the earth during the kingdom as it's being done in heaven. But what is his will that will be done in the earth? His Torah being written upon our heart. Psalm chapter 40 verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Yea, your Torah is within my heart. I delight to do your will. Your Torah is within my heart. The kingdom of the God of Israel is not only his Torah in our heart, but it is Israel gathered from the nations and ruling and reigning with Messiah, being the head of all nations. Acts chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 6 with whom also he showed himself alive, that is Jesus, after his passion, that is um, following his death and then his resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen in them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus was giving a forty-day message on the kingdom of God. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, regarding his message, they ask of him, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What is restoring the kingdom to Israel? That is all 12 tribes united and the Messiah ruling and reigning over them. What is a summary then of the Elijah message of the end of days? The Elijah message of the end of days is to follow Torah and to forsake mixed worship of the God of Israel. The golden calf and Baal worship represent mixed worship of the God of Israel. We're told in 2 Kings chapter 17 that the nation of Israel feared Yahweh while worshiping Baal and the golden calf system of worship. What is Baal worship? It involved setting up sacred trees and worshiping sexuality and sun worship. Baal worship was done in the temple of the God of Israel. Elijah comes and confronts this mixed worship in the end of days, showing the people of the God of Israel the, wick, the mixed worship that they are participating in and that they need to follow the Torah. Mixed worship is accepted in the house of the God of Israel today 
because of religious tradition and a lack of knowledge of knowing Jesus as well as the spirit of rebellion against the Torah personified by Jezebel. The Roman Catholic Church testifies that they changed the biblical Sabbath to Sunday and decreed that Easter should be celebrated. This happened in the first council of Nicaea rather than Passover and they likewise ultimately encouraged the celebration of Jesus' birthday on December 25th. The Elijah message helps the people of the God of Israel to realize the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 19 that our fathers have inherited lies. The ministry message of John the Baptist was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repenting means that you decide to follow Torah which is the way of the God of Israel and his path for our lives. The rabbis foresaw that Elijah would announce the redemption or the end of the exile to the house of Jacob. John, who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, Luke chapter 1 verse 17, announced that the kingdom was at hand. The king who was available to set up his kingdom. This ultimately is the role of the Messiah to gather the exiles of Israel, usher in his kingdom, forgive the nation of Israel for their sins in doing so. The voice of one crying in the wilderness from Isaiah 40 is associated with repenting of your sins and comforting the exiles of Israel. I pray that this message has been a rich blessing to you and it helps you to understand the Elijah message and ministry and its significance as it relates to preparing for the soon coming of Jesus the Messiah. Amen.